Today on Fortnite, I got six no. toys. I was so close. Mom, will you get me a snack? Mom! <sighs> it's time for adult conversation. With me, your host, Brandy Ferner. Hello, Adult Conversation Podcast listeners. Today, my guest Asha and I are talking about the pandemic, our new normalcy, and the impossibility of making school and daycare choices right now. Recording this episode actually helped me get the clarity I needed to pull the trigger on something I was avoiding in terms of the school choices, and it's not what I thought I would end up doing. More about that later. We also get real about the ridiculous expectation that us moms will keep bearing the brunt of this global crisis, and we unpack the idea that no one is coming to save us. But don't worry, we don't totally spiral downward. We also talk about seeds we plant when we're little kids that later bloom into badass women. And the interview starts with one of the most relatable moments as Asha's supposed-to-be napping toddler makes a quick appearance. I had to leave it in because it was just too real, and it's what we're all dealing with. And we may not be able to run off to Vegas for a much-needed mom's weekend right now, but I've got the next best thing, Martha's Book Club and Workshop. Join me and podcast favorite Kathy, who was the inspiration for the book's Martha character, as we see what happens when we mix a book club and a workshop. In this five-week online series, we will unpack themes from my book, Adult Conversation, a Novel, such as the taboo parts of motherhood and marriage, feeling erased, dad privilege, trying to save yourself, the elusive search for balance, and more. Equal parts humor and heart, we will explore how the main character's journey relates to yours while offering validation, community, laughs, and perhaps some action steps for change. The dates are five Saturdays, coming up soon, and it starts on September 26th. For more information or to sign up, go to adultconversation.com slash events. And I want to give a quick shout out to my newest Patreon peeps, Rachel Harper and Heather Allen. Thank you both so much. If you want to join the likes of Heather and Rachel by supporting this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash adult conversation. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash adult conversation. It's just a couple bucks a month and it keeps this podcast alive. And thank you to all of my Patreon peeps. I so appreciate your loyalty, your dollars, and your support. On to the show. Do you have a toddler trying to nap right now? Because yes. you, know, you know that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> well, he's in and out. Usually he's pretty good, but he sees those big flies and he gets really scared of them. I'm like, oh, it's just a fly. Like, it's not a big deal. But right. anyway. But he knows um, you're trying to do something. So it's definitely. like his, his internal radar system is like, no, 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 not today. I know we're normally good. Yeah. <laughs> mommy, mommy. Like, of course. Of course. Of course. Why? Oh. Far be it from me to expect anything. Nice or <laughs> have time to myself. Exactly. How dare you? <laughs> I know, right? Oh my gosh. Okay. Today on the podcast, I'm talking with Asha Daya, who is an author, journalist, and TEDx speaker, as well as a fellow mom trying to juggle work and mothering during this damn pandemic. And currently, right now, she's trying to juggle a toddler. <laughs> Who is supposed to be taking a nap, um, which I think all of us can relate to. Um, Asha runs a women's news media site called Girl Talk HQ, which is all about female empowerment. She claims that one major difference between her site and similar ones is that hers only focuses on positive news. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm about to ask her how she's looking on the bright side of things <laughs> these days. So welcome, Asha. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's, re- it's a real pleasure to be here. Of course. Um, I can hear your cutie pie. Oh my background. gosh. How do I turn myself down? <laughs> No, you're good. I mean, this is, I've had to learn in doing this, especially during the pandemic, that this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Um, I mean, I'm furiously texting my husband like, come on. (laughs) If this isn't the most relatable thing in the entire world, I don't know what is. And it's so perfect because today we're going to be talking about how the hell we juggle all of this. And your son is just perfectly like, this is what we're all doing all day. All day, right? Yes. It's it's a 
balancing juggling acts like from one minute to the next and this is why I feel like more people more big companies should hire moms because we're so adept at doing 50 things at once and really great at time management um but we're not so great at self-care so maybe that's something we should work on (laughs) Uh, true but you know what I've been I've been kind of on the job market just checking some stuff out lately and I got my resume already and I have some things to put on there but I there should be a category for motherhood that's like I can drive a car and also my arm can can go completely oh my to gosh, the other yes. side. I mean, I don't know what job that's helpful for, but this whole the the skill set of motherhood, I feel like really applies to a lot of situations, but there's really kind of nowhere to put it. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, I I, dif- I feel like there's more conversation and more room for okay, how do we incorporate the skills and the experience of motherhood into you know, so many different facets of life. So yeah, I'll be waiting with eager ears to see where that conversation goes. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I've got anything to offer there, but. (laughs) I'm going to try and show up with clean clothes on. I know. It's okay. So we start small. That's number one. (laughs) Um, I'm so looking forward to discussing what this wild time has looked like for you. But before we do that, what is something that the listeners need to know about you? So the way I would summarize who I am or give people a a little bit of an overview, I was born in the UK. I was raised in Australia, hence the accent. Um, My background is Indian, so I'm I'm from a family of immigrants. My great-grandparents were born in India. My grandparents and parents were born in East Africa. So they all migrated under the British Empire to England, and then my family and I moved to Australia. I did most of my growing up there and started my career in media there. I moved to the US in 2008 to further my TV hosting and producing career. Worst year to move to especially the United States um, because of the economy crash. But there you go. That's, you know, young, naive, stubborn me. But also this was in February 2008. So I had no idea what was coming later that year. Um, I come from a really super conservative religious background. And especially when I moved to the United States, it was something that I, I wasn't really aware of how political it was. Um, but I got married for the first time when I was 24 and that didn't turn out so well at all. And I ended up getting a divorce at 29. Um, and then I got remarried again in my early 30s and still married to that guy. Um, he's lucky on, you know, on bad days, he's lucky. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, who, who cannot relate to that, right? Exactly. But um, I have, we have two beautiful kids together. And I, so my background is in hosting and producing. And then I've kind of branched out into using that experience, almost two decades of experience in creating Girl Talk HQ, which I started as a way to kind of create a digital community while I was going through a divorce and leaving Ah. this massive church community as a way to kind of find solidarity with other women and girls who had been through just things and like struggles. And I wanted it to be a place where we could have authentic conversations because coming from my TV background, I was very immersed in entertainment and pop culture. That's That was the bread and butter of what I did. I was an entertainment reporter. Um, I did some news, but mostly pop culture. So that was when my life took a real um, sharp right turn or left turn, whatever you want to say, and found a whole new direction because of those difficult experiences in my life. And and honestly, it led me to where I am today in, in the best possible way. I wouldn't want to ever go back there and, and experience it again, but I'm thankful for who I am and what I've learned because of it. So that's mm. that's me in a nutshell. And I've done so many things that I never thought I would do. I never thought I would be able to do a TEDx talk. Um, yeah. I never thought I would be a published author, but here I am. And mm. and yeah, just so many things. Like I, I, I'm learning to be open-minded and, and leave myself open to what opportunities life has. And this is coming from someone who's super type A, very control freak and <laughs> And all of those things. So that's that's kind of where I'm from, what I've been through, and where I am today. Oh, lovely. Yes, it seems to be that there's a pattern. There's so many of my guests that, and maybe it's just the kind of people that I'm drawn to or I find interesting or who I connect with, but there's a lot of people who've been through transformation because of things that didn't go the way that they had hoped they would. And there seems to be so much wisdom that comes from that. And I think that I'm drawn to talking to people about that and hearing about that. So yeah, I'm excited to to unpack some of that and to delve into that in a little bit. So where are you at with being a mother 
culture during this pandemic? Like, are you having meltdowns? Are you hiding in your car for free time? <laughs> are you forcing yourself to think positive? You have two little ones, right? You have a yeah. – how old are yours again? My oldest is three. He just turned three. And my youngest is 11 months. She's oh. almost about to be – one in October. So yeah, they're very little. They definitely quite a lot of hands-on attention, a little bit less so for my older one because now he's three and he's at just started going back to daycare. But And they can both walk now, which is very, very helpful in a lot of ways. And we just potty trained my oldest one and he's doing really great. Okay. But um, in terms of your question about how am I doing, it's I feel like I've got, run the gamut and gone through mm-hmm. that cycle again and again. It's every few weeks, it's it's like I'm on a, I'm trying to describe what there is, maybe a cycle like, yeah, or a stage, you know, there's like different stages of pandemic, like the <laughs> stages of grief. I feel yes. like I'm, some weeks it's like, we're doing great. I'm exercising, eating less sugar, you know, we're waking up on time. Other weeks it's like, just leave me alone. I just want five minutes. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely been an interesting roller coaster. I've learned a lot about my emotions and how I handle stressful situations, both for good and bad, which, you know, it makes me sad, but then it it makes me happy to know that I'm not the only one going Mm. through that. So I think everything that I had maybe was just simmering below the surface before this has, it's brought it out, you know, because we're just in close quarters all the time. But on on the flip side, which is happening at the same time, is that there have been a lot of beautiful moments that I'm really thankful that we have had, which I don't think we would have had were there not a quarantine period. So especially, you know, with the kids being so little and both my husband and I getting to spend so much quality time in these early formative years has been really wonderful as well. So if all those crazy things can exist simultaneously, they have for me over the past six months. Oh, yes. I think you're so right about that. I I laughed when you said, I've learned a lot about my emotions. I think that that right there for so many of us, like, wow, I didn't know that I could go to those extremes. Right. And so quickly, like this staging or this phasing and the cycle that you're talking about, I definitely feel that too. And I feel it on a bigger scale. Like you said, where there's weeks that things feel like everything's going or maybe a week at a time, everything's going fine. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, why do I want to be in bed for the entire week? You know, it's like, oh, and then then I'm like, I- I'm probably depressed. Is everybody depressed? And then the next day it's like, wait a minute. No, I'm normal again. It's so wacky. And then within every moment of every day, there's mini cycles, right? So you yes. can have a day that's going well and you're like, you know what? This is part of this is a blessing or, or however. And then in the next minute, it's like, I can't take this one oh more God. minute. It's like, it just feels like you have sea legs. Like I, I feel like I can never quite get like on Steady. land. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's such a great description because we're just, it's like a whiplash from one emotion to the other in a 24-hour cycle yeah. or less. And it's yes. like, I guess, is this, this, this is me now? I, I, right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a question I've asked on the podcast before or on other episodes. I'm just so interested in what people have to say about it. But my big question, and my listeners are probably like, Brandy, give it a rest. But <laughs> is is this pandemic version of ourselves the real us? Or is pre-pandemic mm. the version of ourselves, is that our real self? And I don't know the answer. I don't know if this is who we really are or if who we really are is when we're not in a constant stress state. So yeah, yeah what's your good, take? I feel like it's it could be a bit of both. I think there were def- – for me especially, I can't obviously speak for anyone else, but for me, it's definitely brought out things that I would just push to the back of my mind and be like, <sighs> oh, that's not a big deal. I'll deal with that later or it'll sort itself out, which by the way has never sorted itself mm. out of any its situation <laughs> in my life, including right. my first marriage. So I should have learned from that. Um, <laughs> but there are things that – I keep telling myself, all right, when we get through this part, then we'll get back to normal. But who knows how long this normal is going to be? So is it a matter of adjusting our perspective like, okay, this is normal now or do we just keep holding out hope for, you know, what life was like pre-March 2020? I I don't know. I think it's – I'm just taking it day by day and just trying to mitigate my own stress and anxiety and try to, you know, find ways to find the peace in – you know, in my brain more so than anything else because it's just so much going on in our heads that it's the, you know, just finding those moments for myself, having some peace and and also being gentle with ourselves. I I definitely am not gentle on myself enough. So yeah, who knows? I don't know what normal looks like. I think I'm just, 
But then are we just all frogs in a boiling pot? I don't I know. know. I don't know either. And one thing that you said about how this pandemic has accelerated certain things, you know, that you thought, oh, that'll sort itself out. And then you're like, oh, actually, it really doesn't work like that. I've heard somebody um, close to me say that the pandemic is like an accelerant for everything Mm. that you had going on in your life and things that weren't being tended to. And I think that that is absolutely true because you have nowhere to look. You cannot distract yourself anymore. So I think people who tend to be more of a distractor nature who have that person personality type, you can't just let your busy day take you mm. away from thinking about what's really in front of you. And, and you know, along the lines of your, your saying, you know, I've learned a lot about my emotions. We've all had to be with ourselves and sometimes yeah. nobody but ourselves and of course our children and our spouses. <laughs> um, can't forget that. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's not totally comfortable. And to and to then be prodded and pushed in this survival mode, I think it's it's a bit it's been a bit of a messy, not a bit, it's been a messy journey, I think, for, hmm. for most of us. Yeah, there's there's part of me that because I'm a very I love to be organized and I, I'm very time conscious most of the time. And so when I had my second baby, I feel like my anxiety kicked into a higher gear and and we moved into a bigger house so there was more spaces to clean. So then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, dinner time is is going to be like even more stressful. We've got to, we've got to be by the clock even more, even more. And and then the pandemic hit and then all of a sudden it was like we were able to slow down and we still kind of keep to the the kids schedule, but there's less of a, okay, if we don't get to bed on time and get a good night's sleep, then tomorrow when we do the thousand and one things that we need to do, it's never going to happen. But now it's like, well, tomorrow we'll just wake up and have breakfast when it happens. And so that, that part of me, I think it has been really good and that I haven't, I've been able to just slow down and, and not feel like a lot of that was my own pressure. And you know, that took time for me to learn that. Whereas I was always like, I've got to get this done. And, and even my husband would say to me like, what's the rush? Don't worry. If you he'll get to bed, like it'll happen. And right. now I am much more like, okay, yeah, he's going to get to bed at some point. You know, he's not going to stay up forever and we are going to get through dinner and things are going to happen. And it's just my own stress that I've learned to deal with and, and not be so hard on myself when it doesn't go according to plan. I think that's been the case for a lot of people during this pandemic. Yes. Like, how do you, what does it look like to make a plan during this time, especially as parents? So, Yeah. yeah. And how does it look to have to let go? You know, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about when you said, is this our new normal? Can we go back? And as it relates to the, all of the impossible school decisions and daycare decisions we all have to make, I've really been thinking about that lately because my daughter's school goes back in a couple weeks and I'm super torn about what to do. And so what you said reminds me of something because I'm trying to figure out, like, I want to be helpful and socially responsible and help move forward. And so I've really been racking my brain lately about if I send, and I'm just talking about my daughter because my son's doing 100% online and he's like loving life with that. So, (laughs) but for my daughter, who's a second grader, I'm thinking, is it, Is it the more socially responsible thing to do to just keep her home and to not even get involved and to not add another vector in the mix? Or kind of what you're saying about, is this really what our new normal looks like? Is it more socially responsible for me to get involved, have her go back to school during this hybrid program and be one of the parents that's trying to do the right thing and trying to pave a way with the rest of the community that's going back to see how we live like this and how we can get a sense of normalcy back. And so I'm feeling like there's no right choice. And I think we're living in a time where there are so many choices that we don't know what the right answer is. But I'm definitely feeling torn about, do we do everything online and we don't go out in public and we wait Mm. for, I don't know what we wait for, but are we wait for that thing, whatever (laughs) it is, or do we try to try to do our best in creating what this new world looks like. And so that's where my mind has been. And I'm curious with you choosing to go back to daycare, what was that decision like and how has it gone? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I really, my heart goes out to you. It's like such a difficult way to juggle, you know, with two different kids of different ages. But um, yeah, so Frankie was in daycare th- five days a week or at the beginning of March and we were working a lot. I was getting just getting ready to release a book. So I was getting really busy and then we had a newborn and we had part-time nanny and then all of that stopped. So then everyone was home, but we, we've we started to get a little bit busier lately and my husband is a photographer. So his schedule is freelance, which is great, 
because he gets to be home a lot of the time, but then there are stretches of days or a few days a week where he works really long days, you know, on shoots. Yeah. Uh, and we've been lucky that some of the shoots have been at home with literally just like one model and him and, you know, it's it's very safe and responsible and it's been really great. But it got to the point where I look at my son and he is just so playful. He just yeah. loves interaction. He, he misses his friends. And we've we've gone to the beach and the park a few times and done those you know, socially distant hangouts with other parents, usually one family at a time and families we know who have been socially distancing as well. So that's been great. But having that day-to-day brain stimulation and interaction has been, I definitely feel like in the last couple of months, he's been missing that. And so we decided, all right, let's Let's explore what are our options, how many days a week. Maybe we only need two or three days. So we thought, okay, let's do a three-day week. Let's look around. And we had found a really great, a smaller home daycare, which was brand new, just opened up near us. The house was brand new. The lady who runs it is a child psychologist. And we applied and the price was great. And we thought, this is going to be awesome. It's five minutes down the road. Oh, perfect. Um, then we get a call from another daycare, we were on the waiting list for these two really great Montessori daycares near us since uh, October last year, so almost a year. And now, of course, with so many parents choosing to keep their kids at home, they've got all these spots open. So they call us up and they said, hey, we've got a spot for Frankie. Do you want it? And I was just like, yes, we'll take it. They're like, great, okay. And I got off the phone with her and we were talking it over with my husband and then we were like, okay, is this, do we take that spot? I said no to the home daycare and we agonized over this. And I really oh, internalized God. it a lot because I really wanted him to get in there. I loved their curriculum and just their whole setup. The classrooms are beautiful. But the thing that really kind of stuck with me is that they wanted kids to wear masks for eight hours a day and that we had to pay for five days a week regardless of the number of days we chose which I totally Um, understand because they're a business and yeah so I understand that and they're really lovely people and I'm I'm glad that they've been you know that they've got this really great socially responsible system with like masks for kids and hand washing and they were really trying to encourage parents to potty train their kids as much as possible Mm. um, you know just to Mm, mitigate the germs and all of that but for me, I, you know, I know my son and just to get him to wear a mask for eight hours a day just just didn't feel right for yeah. us. And I was really – I had a lot of anxiety over that. Oh, and so we ended up saying no um, oh, to that place right. and that was like my ideal place for him. Mm. So we ended up going with the home daycare and they don't require – the teachers wear masks but they don't require the kids to wear masks. And honestly, it's been great. He's got uh, – one of his little friends goes there as well. So there's only a few kids – so it's not like there's a risk of potential spread with 20 or 30 kids. There's there's only a handful. So It sounds like they're their own little pod sort of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, pre- it pretty much is. And it's, you know, it's close by and it's just been great to be able to send him there the last two weeks just to have that space. And I haven't had any regrets about saying no to the other daycare and sending him to this smaller daycare. And, and also I, I realized that it's not just about making sure he gets – you know, the right stimulation and has a lot of fun and because he loves it. But it's also about us being able to have one-on-one time with our daughter, Zoe. But the whole situation, I was, I mean, those three days until the Monday when I had to call back the daycare and say, sorry, we're not taking the spot. It was the most torturous anxiety ridden Mm. weekend I've ever had, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic. And on a personal level because I was like, are we doing the right thing? Should we train him to wear masks? Is that going to be, do I feel like I'm throwing him into a world where he doesn't need to be doing that just yet? Then I called other moms and I was texting with them. What did you do? How did you go through this? They all went through the same situation of agonizing over what is right. What is my gut telling me? And they're like, we had no idea what was right. And I, you know, our gut intuition radar was all off because of everything that's going on. You just end up choosing what it's like you just have to make that well we did we just made a list of like what do we need what's right what boxes get ticked the most all right that's that's the path we're going to go down I think it was just a matter of like weighing up every single little detail and and 
you know, I, I haven't regretted that decision. So I, I know that, okay, we made the right one for us, for him, for right now, and we'll, you know, assess when things change. So has he come back home with a, with a fever or anything yet? Like, no. Not, oh, that's, see, that's great. Cause I keep thinking about how I if I send my that. daughter back, you know, that's inevitable because it's kids and germs and cold. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that it's COVID, but I'm like, can I, can my nervous system handle her coming home with a fever and then I have to figure out, do we quarantine everyone? Do we get right. her the test? What, you know, how do we handle that at all? And those are the questions that keep going through my mind along with how can I be socially responsible, but how can I be part of the group that figures out this brave new world, you know, or should I do that? And everything is changing on a daily basis. You know, we found out that our school district tried to apply for a waiver so they don't have to follow the same state guidelines. Oh. Oh, and really? Yeah, which is like was not I'm, – I'm sure there's other parents out there who are like, yeah, we don't want to be beholden to our governor's standards, <sighs> but – I wasn't, I'm not one of those people. Yeah. I, it actually made me feel better. So if the waiver gets approved, that's going to change probably my choice too. So my husband and I laugh. We have my daughter in this 50-50 hybrid and online program, but you can move to all online at any time. And we're calling it the pull out method. And so at <laughs> any moment, if we have to pull out and just completely go online, we will. But my thing, and I think a lot of the parents out there maybe are in a similar situation, is by making these changes, my daughter would have to change her teacher. She would would have to and and there my school's online program it wouldn't even be a teacher at her school so she would be with kids she's never met before and i think mm. ultimately i think all of us no matter what we choose and no matter if it's opposite of what someone else would choose i think we're all trying to find what is the least traumatic for our kids yes and we and everybody has a different idea of what that is but i sort of realized the other day why i'm in this spiral about it is because there is no choice that's not traumatic in some way mm -hmm. whether that's low or extreme but i was realizing that we're not wired as mothers and i think as parents in general we're not wired to pick which trauma we want to give our kids so i i know this sounds really yeah. dramatic but it feels kind of like someone's at our schools are asking us well do you want us to use the knife or the rope on your child and we have to pick oh, which form gosh you know what, what I mean? an analogy i mean i know it's awful and it's dramatic but it, it it's, but it's true but it definitely feels like well in which way is it going to be the way where you know kids go to school and they're wearing masks and it doesn't feel anything like school and it's not normal and people might get sick so and then they might have to stay home are we going to do that trauma or are we going to do the possible trauma of not having social interaction and being with a brand new class and being in front of a computer for eight hours a day? And that, you know, so it's like, I don't know what necessarily the right answer is. So I think what you're talking about, just thinking about it in your head and trying to make that decision, I think all of us are in that in some way. And it's just, it's really an awful place as a mother to be because we're not wired to send our kids towards trauma yeah. of some kind or towards something that has no ideal choices. And I think for me, I'm just, I keep looking for a way out. Like in my mm. mind, that's why I think it keeps putting me through the loop is because it's like, Brandy, there's got to be some loophole here where something can sound good. And I'm almost like brain, there isn't, stop it. <laughs> just let me live. You know what I mean? I know. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that word trauma because that, that really is what it is. And it's obviously varying degrees for different people. But when I was having yes. a conversation with my mom about what, which decision we should make and my thought process and, and she's, you know, she lives in Australia with my dad and they were saying, cause their grandkids are here in the United States and in London where my sister lives with her two kids who are a little bit older and they're doing all, they're going back to school in London. Um, she was oh. like, I'm just so heartbroken. I, you know, I, my heart goes out to all the kids out there, how they're going to deal with it. I'm like, yeah, that's, I think that's part of it for me. I feel so heartbroken <sighs> thinking that this is the world that these little kids are going to grow up in. And um, I, it's like, yes. how do I tell them? I'm sorry. I don't know how to change it. it you know, know, it's just so hard. And, oh, right. Oh, Especially so with the hard. little ones. I, I yeah. mean, my, my kids, I have this conversation with my son who's 13. Quite often, you know, he'll say something like, oh, mom, I just miss at school at lunchtime or in passing periods, you know, just seeing my friends and we all talk about it. And I just tell him, I'm like, I'm so sorry, dude, that this is what you have to deal with. And, and you know, I understand we cannot have no trauma for our kids. And also it feels like we shouldn't have to, well, this, I don't 
don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong here. I was going to say it feels like we shouldn't have to choose you know which which form of trauma but maybe this yeah. is like all the other generations who've had awful things that they've had to choose as well and so i try to look at this as this is part of that grit and that resiliency that we want our kids to have so maybe they're you know not but then i also don't want to be like well there's a silver lining here i mean it really <laughs> i guess ultimately it really does suck and to be able to tell our kids i'm really sorry that this is what you're having to do you know is at least i can ha- i can be having these conversations with my kids, but for the little ones, you know, they maybe don't know any better, which is maybe great because they're not, they don't know what they're missing out on as opposed to the older ones. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of both. Like he's at the stage where he understands, like it's normal for him to see us wearing masks if we go out and about and he wears it, you know, if we, if we go to the shops and it's fun for him because it's only like 20 or 30 minutes at a time, but he doesn't fully understand what the virus is, what it's called and how it happened. All he knows is that there's a lot of germs out there and we always have to wash our hands and change clothes when we come back from daycare and all of that before we touch anything or hug anyone. So he understands that and and any more than that, it might get a bit too complicated, but that's all right. At least he knows everything that it's like on a need to know basis for the toddler age. And I'm fine with that. And I'm happy to take on all the stress that he doesn't need right now because I'm sure, you know, as you can tell with your kids that – as you get older, they have their own stresses and their own worries about things. So it's just, you know, trying to find the best way to deal with that and communicate it to kids. And just like you said, that other generations, I think about my parents or especially my great great grandparents and grandparents, um, you know, migrating from different countries and going through so many different turbulent times in their day and age that we, I'm thankful we don't have that, but it's still, it's just like, okay, we deal with what, is in our, our lives right now and the circumstances that we have. And, exactly. But I feel like as moms and as parents, we just want to we, – we never want to see our kids hurting and we never want to see them upset. And, you know, just the thought of my son going, oh, I miss friends. I want to see friends. And one of his yeah. really close friends moved – a family of, that we were really great friends with, the only family that we were really hanging out with, they moved back to Australia because of oh. all of this. And we're like, oh, and he always says – I want to see Leo and it just breaks my heart. Of course. Yeah. Cause we're, I mean, (sighs) we're we're wired to protect them. And so to not be able to do that, we're like, we mal, I know for me, I feel like I'm, I'm malfunctioning. And then, you know, what, what you're talking about has me thinking too, that when I'm worried about if we have to switch my daughter and she has to have a whole new teacher and change everything up and she won't know any of the kids, you know, there's my privileged mom point of view, which is like, well, that would be awful. And then there's (laughs) my like, okay, Brandy, let's, let's bring you back back to the real world and like real struggles, that's not actually a huge problem or maybe even a problem at all that your daughter has to change teachers. Like think about all the people in the underserved populations Mm. and people who deal with racism all the time who have had so much worse, who are homeless. I mean, there's so many different things and I don't mean to make it like I'm I'm never like that person that's like, well, it could always be worse because you're like, shut mm. the fuck up to that person. <laughs> so I'm not trying to do that, but I'm also trying to put into check what my white privileged version of trauma looks like might not actually be, you know, trauma with a capital T. Yeah, I think it's all perspective and and that's all part of how we deal with our own stresses and anxiety, I think, just by taking a step back and be like, all right, you know, the worst is she's going to stay home with me and she's going to be safe and right. and all of that. So, yeah, I think it's it's all a matter of perspective and, and we learn along the way. I mean, we don't have all the answers going into it. We may not have all the answers on the exit, but that's, that's okay. It's just, we have to take it a day at a time and, and not be so hard on ourselves. So. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember seeing a meme that said something like, and just like that, no one ever asked a mother what she does all day, Oh yeah, you know? And even though I felt a twinge of hope that maybe Mm. our unseen work was going to be seen by the world and society, I feel like the weight of the pandemic just quickly fell onto our shoulders as the economy forced itself to resume, even though the support systems didn't. It's like everything Mm -hmm. just defaulted to women will handle this. Mothers will make up for the school. Mothers will quit their jobs. I mean, on all my mom's groups, 
I I see women talking about I'm having to quit my job. I cannot juggle all of these things. And obviously I'm not on dad's groups, but I don't see any dads posting about any of this stuff. I don't hear dads having this conversation. And so I'm just wondering, what's your take on that? Have you seen this happening? Have you known people who've had to quit their jobs? Do you feel like the weight of this pandemic has been put on the shoulders of women since you, you know, work so closely with women's stories? Yes, definitely. I mean, maybe there are some exceptions, but I haven't necessarily come across them yet. But at least in my circle of really close girlfriends who are moms as well, it's just that whole idea of, wait, how did, it wasn't meant to be like this. I thought we were all at home together. And how are you still on the couch while I'm like busting my ass, making dinner, cleaning up, yeah, just all of that. And it's just been, it's been really hard, I think, because I'm one of those people that takes a lot of pressure on myself and wants to try and do everything myself. So that's, that's definitely part of my own fault and my own flaw. Um, mm. But it's like that whole idea of all the things that were simmering under the surface already have now become exacerbated as opposed to fixed because of the pandemic. So now we're locked in a house most of the time. And I, I think it was, you that posted that meme about the guy proposing to the woman, like, yes. will you be my wife and my large, my my life will largely remain unchanged while you change everything about your life? And yes. I'm paraphrasing it horribly, but that's that just sums it up perfectly. It's like, how have I had to sacrifice my body, my mental health, my, my focus on my appearance, you know, just brushing my hair and things like that. Whereas you have so much time to watch YouTube videos on your phone. I mean, I'm not saying this in a bad way to like, you know, diss out my husband, but there have been so many times I'm just like, please get off your phone. You take what there's two kids, one for me, one for you. Let's just divide <laughs> and conquer here. Come on. It's been hard. I'm and and so just for people who um who didn't see that thing I post, it was um from this lady named Sue Rins, who it's a New Yorker cartoon and it's a guy proposing to a woman and it says, Would you do me the honor of taking on even more responsibilities while my life remains largely unchanged? Yeah. And it was just like a, a a hit to the gut because it feels so real and also it's, you know, and I've said this in past episodes about how it's not even personal. It's like the conditioning of the, of the male in our, Mm. in our society. So it's like, it's not even that we would maybe say no, it's just, why can't, why can't we share? And, and I know there's so many nuances and reasons I've had this conversation with my husband about employers, like a part of it stems from employers will s- seemingly and i i believe that if if more men demanded it they would bend but employers are not bending like at the beginning it felt like employers were realizing like oh my gosh everybody's kids are home we mm. don't know this what this pandemic's going to be like and everybody kind of got like a soft spot to be in and then it was like quickly thereafter all of a sudden i know my husband was working more than he worked even before because some of what he does is related to this a little bit. And then I'm like, so where where did it go where we were like had compassion for the fact that all this is being dropped yeah. on us? And I think if more people, and I mean men specifically, would stick up to their employer and say, listen, we had this pandemic hit. My kids have been home nonstop. My wife has other things that she does. She has work that she does. So for an hour or two every day, I am not going to be available. Yeah. And right, like I know that's a huge risk. I know people are probably like, you're crazy. Then people lose their jobs. And so maybe for the people who would really lose their jobs, you don't do that. But then I think there's also this group of people who are high enough up who they could be the people that are making this yes. change. And what if that started happening so that there was more equality? I'm just, I'm all I'm asking for is equality here. I don't, it doesn't feel like right. too much. No, it doesn't. But if you're in that group where you've always been privileged, equality can feel like oppression. I mean, as that saying goes. And, but I think you're right about the culture of how we treat, you know, especially women in the workforce. It, it starts from the top. And while it's frustrating that, you know, a lot of people at the top are still largely white and male and they will only listen to people who look and sound like themselves, Mm. that's okay for now, like to create that, to kickstart that change on a bigger scale. Like those people have to step up and and really just ask for that and, and try to pave that way because we can't shoulder not only the burden, but we can't shoulder having to make the change as well. We we need yes. to be in this together as well. And and it also speaks to a larger scale of, 
you know, not to get super political, but looking at America as the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have a federal form of paid leave that every parent has access to, not just people in certain states or if you work for a company that has a certain number of employers or, you know, everyone, you know, I come from Australia and everyone has maternity leave there. And when I told them that we don't, they're like, what, what do you mean? Or, oh, what do you mean you don't have long service leave in America? I'm like, yeah, that's just, that's not a thing here. And unless you work for certain types of companies or institutions, I mean, things like that, which certain legislators have, all female, have been pushing for a number of years. And now it's people are finally realizing there's, there's a, a huge problem in our society when a pandemic like this hits. Yep. And not only do we not prepare for it on a policy level from the high level, but then systemically and culturally, we don't have support systems and pillars in place to really catch those people when they fall, when companies close down, when people don't have income, when mm. people can't buy food the same way. Like all of that stuff has, has become a lot more exposed and it does trickle down to people's individual lives. And I think we need to really reassess. I don't like conversations when people go, we need to get back to, like, I don't want to go back to anything. I want to go forward in a new way, really have different types of people of, uh, you know, different leadership at these leader leadership tables and boardrooms and halls of Congress and just to really make decisions that serve a wider population because clearly what we've been doing has not been and hasn't been designed to serve a lot of people. So I think there's a lot more room for that. And here's hoping that will happen. And, and especially I, I hope more women will, you know, run for office and, and bring that life experience. You know, people, everyday people like us, I'm not going to volunteer for tribute to run for office ever because it's not something I want to do. <laughs> yes, but same. Um, I'm happy to use my platform and my voice to talk about this thing and, you know, spark dialogue and, you know, be part of any, uh, local actions and anything that I can be part of, sign a petition. But I think yes. we definitely need to, as well as dealing with our own individual circumstances, realize, okay, well, obviously we're not the only ones dealing with this. How do we create change going forward as a, as a country? Because this is something that affects all of us, you know? Yes, it absolutely does. And it affects our marriages. It mm-hmm. affects our relationships. It affects our work. There's just, I just keep thinking there's a, such a more humane way. And I think the numbers are showing that there are more people like us getting involved mm-hmm. in politics, which is great. But then there's a part of me that's like, okay, so wait, we bear the burden and then we have to fix it, yeah. you know, which also yeah. um, on a, in a different way, you know, there's other systems like that, like racism is a system like that too, which is like, oh, so you're going to, you know, you're going to be mistreated and then you're also going to have to fight to get equality. There's so many systems that are like that where the victims of it are actually the ones having to do all of the heavy lifting. And sometimes there's just not the bandwidth available, you know, and then you throw a pandemic on it. It's just, it's, it's wild to me sometimes that we live the way that we do. I I sometimes just like shake my head speechless, um, as I think, you know, many of us do and just, and and then feel, you know, can I feel hopeful that the future will be different for our kids? And I certainly hope so with maybe some of the ways that they're being raised differently, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow and it has been during the pandemic for sure as a mother. Yeah, it is really hard. And, and you know, what you said about having to force victims of a certain system or an injustice to really stand up. It's like, you know, when the the Me Too movement really exploded a few years ago, forcing so many victims to having to go through, re-traumatize themselves by sharing their stories oh, publicly. Right. Like it should, those, you know, just the story of like Weinstein and Cosby and a few others, yeah. I feel like that should have caused a whole army of men to be like, hey, we are the good ones. And so we're going to lead, We're not lead, but like we're going to stand alongside and we're going to create change in, in the places where it's needed. Don't worry, we got this. If you want to share your story, that's great. We support you, but don't you don't have to do all the heavy lifting by yourself. But instead it's like, well, not all men and not yeah. all, you know, we're not, it's like, we know not all men. So come on, then let's, wh- where do you go beyond that? And, you know, the status quo, is is not working for a lot of people. And so I think we're in a really great time for potential um, optimistic change if we continue going, but it is hard because then we, you know, we're, we're struggling with our daily lives, you know, as parents and as mothers and as individuals, but then it's like, okay, we're looking at the bigger problems in our country and around our world and how do we take on all of that? And so (laughs) 
Yeah. yeah, I have no answers. I'm just throwing it out there oh, and please, yes. someone else out there, fix it. I know. Well, and that's the thing, like what you're talking about is, you know, the moment that you realize nobody is coming to save us, that we yeah. have to band together, which is a lot of the reason why I do the work that I do, which is even just to maybe validate for people who feel like, isn't it crazy that nothing is ever being done about this or seemingly, and, you know, even just to say to somebody, yeah, you're not crazy for feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, m the section that I am so passionate about, obviously, is the motherhood angle. But there's so many, so many systems that I've talked about on the podcast and even ones that I don't have. These are, th this is why some days it feels like you just want to stay in bed because it becomes yeah. so overwhelming. Um, but I think that's where each of us can like find our own niche. Like you were saying yes. with you, it's motherhood. It's like, we don't have to do all the things. We can find something that really strikes a chord in us and be like, all right, let's start there and, and see where it takes us. Yes, absolutely. Has the pandemic changed or accelerated your point of view on anything related to female empowerment or patriarchy or anything? Is there anything that just became really crystallized for you throughout this? Yeah, I think it has for sure. Um, one of the things is, and you mentioned it just earlier about how there's no one out there that's going to come and save us. And so I, I had a, um, at the beginning of this pandemic, I had a, a book release date set, which was March 18. And the book that I wrote is called Today's Wonder Women, Everyday Superheroes Who Are mm. Changing the World. And it's a collection of 50 interviews and essays of women from mostly North America, but also around the world who are just doing incredible, brave, badass, inspiring mm. things. Awesome. And I had this whole uh, like East Coast tour planned. We were going to go on the Today Show. When I say we, I mean my, my publicist and I. And <laughs> right. It was great. I spent all this money and then all of that just stopped. Uh. Had to cancel all my pl uh, travel and all of that. But so now I've been finding, you know, different ways to try and talk about the book and while also finding time for myself. So basically it never happens, but there you go. <laughs> uh, but one of the right. things that I've really, I've had a lot more time to think about what is it about this book and what I'm doing with Girl Talk HQ and my passion in general that is really important to me. Like, am I doing it just because it feels like I've got on, gotten on this train and I'll just have to keep going or am I really, do I really care about this stuff? And so that's been really great for me to have that just extended period of time to reflect. And a quote that I really, really love is, um, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And yes. it was written by a South African poet named June Jordan. And she wrote it about a lot of the activism that was happening during the apartheid. And she documented a lot of the ways um, black women were really standing up and you know, organizing grassroots actions, but they didn't get a lot of the attention that, you know, the bigger figureheads did. And one of my really close girlfriends, who's an uh, Emmy award winning documentary filmmaker, she always says to me, like, there's no knight in shining armor out there that's going to give you a million dollars to get you to make that TV show or that film. Like, you can do it yourself. And she's done that a lot with her projects. And so it really made me realize that a lot of women are. You know, we use our talents, our voices, our stories, our experiences, not just to benefit ourselves, but for the betterment of other people. And, and yes. I really love that. And I've seen that with, I've seen a few different documentaries about women who ran for Congress in the midterms in 2018 and hearing yes. about their stories. Like th these aren't women who are necessarily very rich or they don't come from wealthy families or well-to-do, well-known families. They're just everyday women who experience things and like, I want to create change. I see a problem. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to do something about it. And for me, that was all the women in my book, but also women that I have seen just in my life and throughout the work that I'm doing that have really inspired me to go, okay, well, if I'm not going to just wait around for someone to do something for me, what am I going to do? And what am I passionate about? And how do I use my resources to do something that's beneficial to others and creating mm -hmm. change? And it doesn't have to be change on a huge level. I mean, it can be, but it can be like impacting one person's life or just in your household or your community, you know, whether it's starting a meal drive for new mothers in your neighborhood or, or whether it is trying to create new legislation that's going to help more mothers have access to maternity leave or money in those early years where they need it and they're not working as much. So there's, there's just so many things that I admire women for doing. And I think that's got, I, I want to be part of that ongoing cultural, collective of people amplifying that and 
bringing that to the surface and talking about it more. Mm, Yes. Oh my gosh. When you said about how the women that you've interviewed for your book and just women in general, that a lot of times when they are moved to get behind something or run for office or whatever the case may be, it's for the betterment of the entire culture. That just so you know, resonated with me because I think uh, so many women that I talk to, I feel like almost every woman that comes on my podcast, when we talk about, you know, how did you get into this? It was because I went through something or I was with somebody who went through something Mm. and I wanted to support anybody else who would ever go through that. It's such a beautiful thing. And obviously it's not everybody, but I definitely see when you find somebody who's passionate about something, there is usually a reason like that. And it's just such a beautiful thing you know, yeah. to, to say, I just want other people to know that they're not alone. Like even just that feeling and the feeling of community that so yes. many of us have. And I think motherhood really does that to us mm-hmm. because after we become mothers, you know, we're like, how do I do all of these things? And we have questions and we all of a sudden have a whole new language that we speak about, you know, spit up and being up all night and nipples and, you know, all of this stuff. And so you have to find other people who speak that language. And I always think it's interesting how, you know, when all this, the school stuff and like, are we homeschooling? Are we online? Are we all the pandemic stuff? You know, my mom groups were just going off and it's like all the moms are like, how do we fix this? How can we pull together? What can we do? How can we provide for people who don't have enough? How can, you know, all of these things where they're coming together. And then I wonder, A, it's so sad, but I don't think dads have these same communities. And it makes me wonder, like, they probably don't need them. But then also, I pr- maybe they do. Like, would dads yeah. love to have in this a different community? way? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I hear from my husband a lot. Like, he gets very, he's very close with a lot of his close friends in back in Australia. And every now and then, he'll say, "Oh, I'm homesick. I miss my friends." And it's hard to find. That, you know, he has surfing yeah. buddies, but it's it's not on the same level. And I think that guys. Maybe they haven't been taught the same way we have as women, you know, right. that whole idea of community. And But I think they would benefit from community and sharing their problems in a way that they don't have to be competitive or out-masculine each other or, you know, things like that yes. and just really have that um, bond from a sense of authenticity and complexity rather than, oh, this is me. I'm black and white. I'm a man. See you later, guys. Right. You know? Yeah. They're just not conditioned to seek it out and probably accept it. Um, common sense would tell you that every human would benefit from community like that that's authentic yeah. and supportive. And it makes me feel both ways. It makes me feel sad on one hand and you know makes me want to raise my son different so that he mm-hmm. values community and he wants to start community. But then it also, of course, makes me a little bit rageful because it's like, well, if you're not building a community, then when something like this goes down and we have to figure out school stuff, well, I'm the one who's built a community, many yeah. different communities. So then it falls on my shoulders because I'm the one that's that has done the building but also you weren't conditioned to do the building so I'm not mad at you and it's not personal but also yeah. build the communities you know yep yeah yeah I think yeah. it's it's all in like how we we can make the choice to raise our sons and daughters differently and yeah it's it's like I don't want to blame people like my husband because it's the the system and the culture that he was brought up into yes. what I blame him but at the same time it's like Oh my God, there's only so many things I can (laughs) tell you off about. Yes. uh, And you know, when he says to me, someone's like, oh man, I don't know how you do it. I don't think I could do it. I'm like, don't say that because you could do it. You could. And you know, don't, don't sell yourself short and don't, don't like fake me out thinking, oh yeah, I'm the only one who can do it. You know, so it's. It's all about how do we change the culture. Right. And then it's too, it's if you had to do it, you would do it. I mean, how many times have you said to, you know, maybe your kids are too young, but maybe you've said to your spouse, if I wasn't here right now, what would you do? You would have to find a way. I've said that so many times. (laughs) Yes. This is a thing that I say all the time too. And it's like, that's the thing is when it's like, I don't know how you do it all. It's like, it's it's necessity because when all of a sudden you have a baby that's crying that needs to be fed and it's not working and then you're trying to heal from birth, like you suddenly realize oh shit, I need people. Yeah. Um, what inspired you specifically to get into the f- female empowerment niche? Like, was there something specific that happened to you or was it more ideological? Does it come from your your cultural background? Where did that stem from? Yeah, there's. A, I've thought about this a lot because it, it's, it's not like one big, bright, aha, shining moment, but there have been a couple of things that I can 
definitely identify. So growing up, my family, although we're Indian, we were never big Bollywood fans, but my mom especially would really love um, independent Indian cinema where there were stories about like women who were hard done by in their village Mm. and they rose up and overcame and became the conqueror and, you know, helped all these other women just, you know, outcasts who were then became the hero or became the prime minister, or all films like that. And so in the back of my mind growing up, that was what I was exposed to just subconsciously, just through her. And she was always very understatedly inspired by that. And I, my mom had her own feminist tendencies without ever having to say it. But now that I look back on it, it's like, yeah, of course, that's, of course, that's who she was. And uh. even to this day, we text each other like, oh, you got to watch this film on Netflix. It's great. And so that, that's that been one thing that I can point to. And a couple of years ago when I went back to Australia and I was cleaning out an old closet and um, just all these old folders that I'd kept, I found this folder where I'd started through my colleges collecting articles in like women's and teen magazines that were just, none of them were about celebrities, but they were all articles about women who started an organization who to help uh, trafficking victims or to help people with um, who'd gone through breast cancer and just all these amazing articles and snippets and stories of everyday heroic women. I was like really blown away because I don't even remember why I started collecting that, but Maybe it was, I got to a point where I'm like, I'm sick of the whole celebrity thing. I want stories of real women. And, or maybe it was the inspiration for my mom, and, but I just didn't know how to put words to it. So it was those two things that that were definitely kind of, it was like a seed growing in my life, I guess, from an early age. But then what really propelled it forward, I, I would say, was going through a divorce and leaving my very ultra conservative church background. And in that church community, uh, it was a very large church and I was very, very involved in all sorts of things. I was singing in the band. I was doing oh. Bible studies. I was taking Bible classes, um, what do you call it, theology classes, things like that. Um, but then when I was going through a divorce, I thought, okay, I've got to step down from all the ministries and, and things that I was, you know, I was a very public facing person in those activities. And when I stepped away, no one called me. No one reached out to be like, Hey, we haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Um, is everything okay? Not one person. And I think what bummed me out the most was none of the women that I was friends with reached out to be like, Hey, is there anything I can do? Like no one. And the only people that did reach out to me were, there were a bunch of like super fundy guys who were like, Oh, you shouldn't get divorced because God hates divorce and just trying to shame me and not knowing anything about me. I was like, block, see you later. But then there were a couple of friends who, And it's sad because I'm not really friends with them anymore, but there were a couple who reached out to me and said, well, Asha, you have to, you know, and they would just go through the list of rules and go down that checklist of what that those, you know, those religious circles really kind of drill into you. And I felt really abandoned and isolated and it just bummed me out that no matter how many details I would tell them, like, this guy is doing this to me and he's threatening this and oh. here's all the emails and text messages and here's what his parents are telling my parents, like, hello, surely this is going to make them be like, all right, no worries, what we got your back. It was like, well, you know, and just that equivocating on, hey, I'm really going through something here and I'm alone. My parents are on the other side of the world. I don't have anyone and you are my closest friend and you just left me high and dry in favor of, like, following – the rules, uh, uh, it just really, really, I don't, it just bummed me out. I don't really know yeah. any, I was dis- disappointed. I was upset. I was angry. And so at that point I was almost starting Girl Talk HQ. I was figuring, figuring out what I was trying to do with my careers. And then it kind of clicked to me that, you know, I want to use my m- media and career experience and I want to marry this experience that I'm going through na- right now with a divorce and, it was, it was like two divorces, leaving the church, which oh, I've been part of yeah. since I was born, wow. um, although it is a little bit of a different landscape in Australia. I will say that. It's not as political. But nevertheless, that was my life growing up and, and then going through an actual divorce. It felt like, well, where's my community? Where's my family? Where is that sense of like fellowship and intimacy, all these things that are drilled into me yes. from this religion? All of a sudden, it was gone because... I had broken one of the the rules that were kind of set in place and oh, it was really shocking and eye-opening to me that I didn't even have a community of women that I could rely on and speak to and the only person that really did 
that I am still friends with to this day, she was also going through divorce um, in that church. And so we're still friends and, you know, we commiserated a lot. And if it wasn't for her, it would have been a lot harder and and having work to distract me. But I think that really solidified for me, you know, the, the importance of, of female friendships, um, not at the expense of anything else, but just for me as a woman, a young woman and a young woman of color growing up in a world where I never felt like I fully fit in uh, looking at media and looking around me, but realizing that, well, I have an opportunity to create something, create a community, um, share my story and find other stories and bring women together. And I, I wasn't afraid to do that. And so I'm going to do that. And so I think yeah. that's what really started for me. And then it's definitely evolved and refined itself along the way as I've written for this blog and and written this book and um, done the different film projects that I've been involved, uh, media projects I've been involved in. But I, I've learned so much about who I am as a person, what I believe in, what my values are, and just learning about feminism, female empowerment, just the idea of more women in public spaces and the representation of women yes. and media and public office and in even in religious circles I, in, at the leadership level we don't see too many of those and so it really it really started my own journey but also my passion for wanting to uplift other women who have a story to share or who want who are craving that authentic and complex flawed just real connection with other women as well. Yes. Oh my gosh. What an awful realization that the community that you had invested so much of your time and your heart into basically dropped you the second that you weren't following all of their rules. I mean, I'm, yeah. that's, I'm so sorry you went through that. That had to be, like you said, like a second divorce. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it. I, I look back on it now and I think I know, and I know I'm not the only one because I've since connected with other women from there mm. who we've spoken and shared just just really awful, traumatic, and just really depressing things that they've gone through and different to me. And it's just like, oh, that's so disappointing. And where is that authenticity? Where is the where are those genuine relationships that we're supposed to cultivate as part of our belief system in that church anyway? And obviously I'm not speaking for religion on behalf of everyone because everyone has a different experience, but I do know that there are so many like me who've experienced the same and, and, you know, have found community elsewhere in just finding other people who have been through spiritual abuse and and trauma and they've bonded on that and created that community. Um, There is a huge ex evangelical community online if, if anyone is interested, but yeah, I think that that really solidified for me, okay, this is, this is what I'm meant to be doing in life. And this was, this is what all that um, exposure to those independent Indian films were about for my mom and my immigrant background (laughs) and my media experience. It's now all going to come together and you're going to be doing this. And so, yeah, so I'm still, you know, I I feel like I'm still in that infancy of that journey, but it's, it's definitely, it feels like this is my space and I don't feel the need to compete or feel inadequate in any other way because I'm just, kind of creating my own thing, I guess. Yeah. And it's funny that you said about finding those old articles that you had ripped out about inspiring women. It's like your book seed was planted so many years ago. Did you know that? Like when you, when you finally got the like, okay, I'm going to do this. Did you remember anything from before that you had been interested in it before? Like, was it a seed that you knew in that moment? Someday I'm going to compile stories and put this book together or had you completely forgotten? Because I think that's such an interesting thread and it sounds like it was kind of an invisible thread. I think it's an invisible thread because I hadn't thought about it at all until I'd seen it in front of me cleaning out that closet. And it's just such a, it was such a confirmation to me because it made me realize that, okay, it's not random. I'm not just following some trend or trying to copy what someone else is doing. Like this is something that I wanted to do for a long time. And it is funny, like you mentioned, like ripping out those, and this was a thick folder, you know, like those thick folders where you have those plastic inserts and the paper protectors. Um, I mean, that was chock a block full of articles. And I don't know how long I was collecting these for. And hopefully it's still, uh, my mom hasn't thrown it out. I don't think she would have, (laughs) but you never know when you're clearing out so much stuff. But yeah, it, it, it was really, it was just really cool to see that the earlier version of me was like laying the groundwork in little ways, even though I didn't know it at the time. And I didn't, 
realize it until years later and had completely forgotten about it as well. So that was like a cool uh, reminder. Yeah, you know, I've talked to people who say, including uh, a therapist Who's, who says, you know, when you're trying to figure out what you want to be or what you want to do in the world, go back to what you liked doing when you were a kid. And so, you know, hearing about your story, uh, it reminds me of when I was a kid, there were so many things that I liked to do. I was such an independent kid when I really look back on it. But one of the things was obviously writing and I would just sit at the computer and I would write stories and then I would bind them in a book. And then there's like a point. And so what's funny is like, well, why didn't I, why wasn't I an English major or a creative writing major? Mm. It's like your mind goes to this different place. And I know my parents were always a business minded family. So that's always where subconsciously the rails were kind of put. But I think about how interesting it was that like little Brandy back then couldn't have known that she would end up actually wanting to do that as an adult. And I feel like the same thing for you. And I'm wondering for listeners out there, people have must have moments where they were a child and they planted some seed that they didn't later know would, you know, bloom when they were an adult. And I just think that's an interesting idea to think about. It's so beautiful too. Like when we're young, that idea of the naivete and not in a bad way, but it's like we instinctively know who we want to be when we're at a young age, when we can't even put words to it. Yes. But then life takes over and culture takes over, and media takes over, we get distracted. But at some point, I'd like to think hopefully most of us find our way back to that. And it's okay that it takes a number of years because we have to live life a little. We have to go through stuff and we have to have those experiences that force us to be drawn back to, okay, what is our first love? It's like the journey of the alchemist. Uh, um, For anyone who's read that book, I didn't, I read that book years ago. My husband gave it to me to read. and I was like, I don't really understand this. Like, (laughs) cool. He finds, he goes back to his home and he finds everything like, that's great. But now I'm like, I get it now, Mm, you know? So it's like, it's almost like you have to be ready and willing in that place of wanting to find that. And then you realize, okay, this is, this is who I am. And it could be so many things. It doesn't have to be one thing, but yeah, that first that first love that we have. And the and the obstacles that get in the way, like I have a client who I was working with um because I do book doula sort of writing consulting stuff and this woman was telling me which I think is a really common story. I also saw it at the writers retreats I went to is uh, she's a mom and she said, you know, I've had this idea for a story and I've kind of written little pieces of it here and there, but it just feels silly. Like what am I doing as a grown adult woman? coming up with ideas for a story. Like it seems very frivolous. It it took me a moment and I, and you know, that I talked to her and then, like I said, at different writing retreats I've been to all the moms, we're in this like grown woman, many of us suburban, you are now all about your kids bubble that we don't see creative people in our real life. And we don't, we don't talk to them. We don't share these things. So you walk around Mm. as a creative person in this, for moms, I think, you know, in this suburban mom world, and you think you're a weirdo because, (laughs) you know, because you care, because you think, uh, I mean, I do this all the time where I see something and I write down a little note that's under the tab next book, because it's like, (laughs) it's such an interesting character trait or, you know, the, a quirky way somebody does something. And then I think nobody else does this. Am I the only one that does this? But I've made, I've accepted it, but talking to writers at the beginning of their journey who haven't accepted it yet, it's like, I feel so lucky to be able to say to them, you are allowed to love story. That does not mean you are not a competent adult or that you're being silly. And it's just so interesting that sometimes people need the outside validation with creativity that as an adult, you are allowed to do that thing. It just kind of, it kind of blows me away every time. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that's so interesting to hear that you hear that from people in your writing community. I mean, a grown ass woman wrote Harry Potter and people probably thought her ideas were really stupid. Like, Hogwarts, what is that? Like, go get a real job. I mean, Seriously. I'm, I'm sure pro- so, probably so many people said that to J.K. Rowling, but yes, uh, and here we are today. I mean, I can imagine her, you know, at gymnastics practice sitting in the room that everybody has to sit in and all the moms are talking about Instapot recipes or whatever. Right. And she's over here writing like, muggles, that's the word. That's yes. what I'll use, you know, and just feeling. Yeah, feeling, Gryffindor, yeah. what a name. Yeah, and, th- <laughs> and then they do this. Oh my gosh, and then there's this cloak that's invisible, like all the yeah. things. And meanwhile, the other moms are like, um... 
what about picture day tomorrow? Do you have the picture day outfit? Like, and that's yeah. how I feel all the time. <laughs> and especially when I was writing my book and I would be a gymnastics practice writing away and I just hear all the conversations going and I'm like, I'm such a freak. And also <laughs> I can't be anything different, so I'm not going to fight it. But, right. you know, so I, I feel like it's an important thing, like what you're talking about is for people to look at what did you love when you were younger? And then also the other part is you're allowed to still love that thing. Yeah, absolutely. Giving ourselves permission to be who we really truly are inside and and finding time to strip away all those messages and and barriers that we've put up because of what we're quote unquote supposed to be. It's like, yeah, how do we do that? Yes. Asha, can you tell us where we can find you online and will you repeat the name of your book and where people can find that as well? Yes. Yeah, so the book is called Today's Wonder Women, Everyday Superheroes Who Are Changing the World. And you can find it at todayswonderwomenbook.com. Um, you can buy it on Audible as well as Amazon and Target Books. The links are all on that website. You can check out girltalkhq.com. Um, Brandy has also written a fabulous article about her book, um, pandemic book on there. So check that out <laughs> and all the other amazing stories. If you have a story to share and want a place to share it and don't know where to start, please get in touch um, by going to that website. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, just at Asha Dyer and at Girl Talk HQ. So check it out, check us out, check me out yeah. and get in touch and do all the things. Oh gosh. I, I would just want to say for the listeners out there who are feeling like, oh, maybe I should tell my story and are feeling like, but my story is maybe not as interesting. Do it. And there's something that's so important about having somebody hear your story. So I didn't necessarily realize this when I started the podcast, but so many people who have come on the podcast afterwards tell me, I just, th you know, I, despite if I did a good job or whatever, but just say, thank you so much for just hearing my story and Aww, making me feel so like it's important because it is. But just, I just want people to know that, you know, there's more to telling the story than just what you give other people. You also get something from sharing mm. your story. So I just don't want people to discount that. So if you feel like you feel drawn to do it, do it. That's what I want to say. Yeah. That's very beautifully said. I love that. Aww, thank you. Um, Asha, <laughs> thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, it sounded like your little one maybe fell asleep. I think he's asleep. So okay. there's no noise in the background. We have a victory today, people. <laughs> I feel like we've won the war or at least we, yes, we, we've won the battle. Today. Yeah, we've won the battle. <laughs> maybe not the war yet. But yeah. Thank you again so much for the work that you do and for coming on here and giving us insight about all of the things that are going on in your life. Life and I just so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This conversation has been so great and so refreshing and therapeutic for me. So uh, right back at you. I'm, I'm really thankful for you, Brandy. So thank you for uh, the work you do as well. Yes. The medicine of adult conversation <laughs> during a pandemic. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. Like I mentioned earlier, talking all this out with Asha, the part about which choice is more socially responsible, and then my epiphany about the trauma with a capital T versus lowercase t and how my privilege really played a part in that, led me to switch my daughter to 100% online schooling. I'd been gearing myself up to send her back to school a few days a week, but I realized that the amount of emails and back and forth about opening and closing and the mental spin I was in about all of this and how I felt uncomfortable and not ready but then sort of ready was not worth what we would be getting with in-person learning. Our teacher had showed us what the classroom would look like, and it was bare. There was no lending library, no flexible seating, no sharing supplies with your neighbor, a masked teacher and classmates. It had been stripped of all the most fun parts of school, the connective tissue that my daughter most looked forward to, like art time and friends. So I just thought to myself, I'm putting myself through all this chaos and avoiding a teacher switch for my daughter to go back to this? And maybe going back to a potentially unsafe sci-fi novel looking classroom might be trauma with a capital T, whereas being in a loving, safe home might be trauma with a lowercase t, or none at all. But I held my breath and made the switch and I was surprised at how much immediate relief I felt. 
All the emails keep coming through about the new updated opening plans, like every day, and there's always updates and ways that they're trying to get around the rules, and I don't have to click on any of these emails. It is so freeing, and I have so much more mental space now to overthink other things. (laughs) So this feels like the right decision for us, and my daughter's been doing great with it, and not only that, but... She's making new friends because she has to, and she's learning how to adapt. And while I was worrying about what this switch would do to her, it's shifted to what is this switch doing for her? And so I hear her talking to these new friends that she's never met before and telling me about how excited she is because in the chat, they've been asking each other to be friends because a couple other kids are new kids. And I realize This is actually an opportunity for her. So I'm happy that I I switched my attitude on that. But I know there are so many parents who feel the exact opposite, that their in-person classrooms do offer their kids something valuable. And I get it. There are no right choices in this moment while we're all struggling to do what's best for our kids and ourselves with no ideal options. The only right choice is not sending your kid to school sick. So good luck to everyone out there or in there, whichever you choose. As always, thanks for listening.